Hey, thanks for the invite to, to speak, Anne. And I wasn't originally on the program, so you know, thanks for squeezing me in. And the, and the in most interesting thing ab about this is, as I've heard the speakers today, how impressed I've been um, with them and with the conversation, and and how I'm, I was kind of sitting there quietly going, "Oh, damn, that's in my presentation." And you know, but 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 the great thing about that is I get to sort of follow up some some great speakers with some of the things that that I. Um, that I've learnt over the uh, over the last little while. I originally had a science background. Um, I did uh, earth science and biology, and I spent. Uh, I mean, I, I taught in a British university. I worked in Africa as a scientist. I did some great things. I came home to New Zealand at a time when there wasn't really a great market for sort of science-based people. Um, I got a. I, I got a job that I didn't like and then I left. Then I got in business. I've been in business for the last 20 years doing business consulting, um, business improvement development, that kind of thing. But I always had this um, innate and an incredibly sort of a longing to return back to that, um, the, the background that I had in, in science. And so um, about 2016, um, my wife and I did a permaculture design course and uh, it, it just made sense to me. I couldn't understand why, why, why most people weren't understanding how those principles um, fitted together. And, and, and to me it wasn't, it wasn't weird or, or anything like that. Um, I, I've done a lot of work uh, since then, my own study if you like, on um, the relationship between you know, energy, the economy, environment, geopolitics. Um, financial systems, just all of the stuff that's sort of going on in the world today. And um, last year, to sort of pivot into the more into the agricultural space, um, I uh, applied for the um, the Kellogg program through the New Zealand Rural Leadership Trust and was accepted to that. So, uh, Kellogg program is a leadership development program in agriculture. Uh, you get to choose your own uh, topic and project, of, and the um, I chose a, a topic related to how we could implement. Uh, permaculture and regenerative agriculture principles through the permaculture design process to reimagine the pastoral system in New Zealand. So quite a quite a lengthy, chunky kind of um, series of interrelationships. Then, fully a third of my report was about energy, but we're not going to talk too much about that today. Um, there's a series of lenses that, when we look at, at issues, if you look through an energy lens or an economic lens or a social lens or what have you, the story changes. So our concept of reality shifts. Um, so that's one thing I've learned a lot over the last few years. But um, I, I want to present to you in the next sort of 10 to 15 the, uh, the summary of some of the, of the concepts that came out of, came out of my work. And, and I think that'll land the plane for us quite nicely today in, some of the, in terms of some of the stuff that we've spoken about um, in the discussions that we've had, which I've, I've really enjoyed listening to. So I've been here to learn and I've, d and I've done a lot of that. Um, so uh, I think you'll um, appreciate sort of where we're coming from. So, I don't know about you, but you know all you Elon Musk fans out there. But that up there is is our home. You know that's where we live. I'm not terribly interested in going to live on Mars, growing potatoes in my own excrement. You know that's not really, that's not really where I'm kind of at. Uh, I think we need to look after that thing and and, and focus on, on on that as um, you know if you want if you want a good definition of biophysical limits. I mean. That would be it, right? Because it's pretty dark and black outside of that. Yes, there are some lovely stars out there, but living on the moons, that's our nearest neighbour, and that looks pretty bleak to me. So um, I, I prefer to focus on that. Um, there's the topic of the um, of the uh, of the program of the project that I did. I underlined it: permaculture design, implementation of regenerative agriculture, addressing addressing global global macro challenges. <laughs> Um, we're looking for better outcomes in pastoral farming. And, and what I summarised that um, to uh, with Zeb was, look, we need to create, and someone said it today, I think it was um, um, the other, the other uh, Michael, was it the, um, uh, who was the guy talking about? No, Stephen. Stephen, yes, Stephen, yeah. He was talking about 50-year um, plans. And, and, and this is all about 100-year thinking. We, we live our life in, in, in political cycles. We live our life in property cycles. We have all these relatively short-term um, cycles, but it's not until we um, connect with those longer cycles that we understand um, we can put our thinking into context and allow ourselves the freedom, if you like, to um, to express our true potential when it comes to dealing with a landscape. And that's what I love so much about what Greg and Rachel have done here. And many of the people who are involved in farming, it, it's intergenerational. There's much more of a, a longer-term focus. So it, there are two contrasting mindsets, right? That is not a picture from New Zealand, thank God. Um, there is this, right? There is machine thinking. It's a linear process. It's complex. 
It values uniformity, it creates vulnerability, and it requires high energy inputs. And we've just spent a whole lot of time in the last 10 minutes talking about our supermarket system. We're talking about a centralized, long supply chain, complex process with uniformity, vulnerability. Look at the supply chain issues we've had over the last little while. Uh, and it requires high energy inputs to maintain those systems. And so that's one kind of thinking, machine thinking. Um, the other kind of thinking is the ecosystem thinking. Complex interactions with a, a huge value on diversity. We've heard a bit about that today, or a lot about that today. And what that does, it creates resilience and it doesn't require a lot of external energy input other than the conversion of solar energy through solar panels into sugars and plants and then their, their transfer into um, protein through animals. That's a very efficient system and the great thing about that is that we don't really have to sort of do too much that. That does that by itself. Greg doesn't go out there and try and encourage um, one of his animals to eat some grass. They like to do that by themselves and you know. So what I want to cover in the next sort of 10 or 15 is the impacts of industrial agriculture. Oh, who was I talking about? About my son taking amazing photographs. Was I talking to somebody about that? Yeah, that's one. That, that's the photograph he took. <laughs> he didn't think it was very good. You know, that's a great. My son took that shot. Yeah, just yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> so I was searching for the shot and I couldn't find it, and there it is. Right. Um, the impacts of agricultural of industrial agriculture, uh, regenerative and permaculture principles and the relationship between those two things creating um, a solution. So let's, uh, let's, let's crank into it. Um, impacts of industrial agriculture, we've been down this road before we know what they are. Soil degradation and loss, pollution of aquatic ecosystems, land use challenges, water allocation, excessive use of synthetic nitrogen, lots and lots of challenges like that, loss of, um, of, of native biodiversity, endemic species, and increased um, detection of pesticide residues in foods. So all kinds of nasty things happen. So this is, um, this is a, uh, a graph I got from Mike Joy about the water quality in New Zealand. You've seen a 1,300% increase in synthetic nitrogen fertiliser um, since 1990. It's, uh, and that's obviously directly proportional to the increase in intensity of, um, of pastoral farming in New Zealand. Uh, areas like Southland, Canterbury, um, you know, all over the country. But look, at, but look at the associated water quality effects, the Selwyn River, Ashburton and Manawatu, uh, in the top five most polluted rivers in the world. <laughs> um, it's just, it, it's crazy. So, regenerative agriculture and permaculture principles. This is the perception... <laughs> <laughs> This. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's the perception of permaculture, right? When I when I talk about permaculture, that was the kind of stuff I got. I gave this presentation to a group of farmers and farm people. I was the only person who came from a non-farming background in that environment. And when you talk permaculture, that's the kind of response you get. The interesting thing about permaculture, and I've given you this on your handout, is is that we, we've, we've actually talked about three or four of the principles today. We talked about change at the margins, we talked about observation, we talked about um, creatively responding and adapting to change, we talked about self-regulation and feedback, we talked about a lot of these kinds of things. So I won't go into the origins of permaculture, I haven't got time for that, but suffice to say there are, um, I think it's 12 really, really well-established permaculture principles. Who's done, who's done a PDC in the room? Right, okay, so there we go. Preaching to the choir. Thanks for that. Next slide. Um, what is regenerative agriculture? Gwen Grillet, as part of the, and, uh, the Our Land and Water Program through the government funding, Lanky Research Scientist, um, did a white paper which was published last year trying to do what I tried to do, which was to define regenerative agriculture, which defies definition. You know, we take a Western scientific reductionist mindset and we try and define a series of principles. It's just about impossible. And that's going to be the stumbling block, stumbling block from a government perspective around regen ag. It's very, very difficult to actually define uh, in a little box. So what happened was... Um, they, Gwen's work, I spoke with her at length about this, they came up with a series of 11 principles around um, what regenerative agriculture, the regenerative mindset was. So she got away from having to define it by coming up with a series of principles and that 
those are the, are the principles there from the paper. The interesting thing about it is there is significant overlap between permaculture and regenerative agriculture. So it doesn't matter what pajamas the horse is wearing, right? It's still a horse. This is the kind of thing about, um, uh, about these things. So as long as we can stay at the principle level rather than um, diving into definition and detail and losing focus, we, we, we've got a hope. Yep, next one. So if we can put those two things together, what I think we can do is we can, um, we can find a really, really effective solution to how to implement that. And who's come across, um, this is the other model on the other side of the page, who's come across Dan Palmer's work? You have, eh? Yeah. Um, heaps of you guys, right? So this is Dan Palmer's, um, and I think it was Alan, Alan, Adam Grubb as well, this is their permaculture design process. If you look at this particular process, because when I saw regenerative agriculture, permaculture, then I looked at Dan's process, which we did during the PDC and worked with Dan on how that worked. The most amazing thing about it is it contained a step-by-step -step process for how to implement this kind of stuff at farm scale. Now, I know that there's... Um, you know, guys like Darren Doherty, we were talking about last night. Uh, Shane talks about Dar uh, Shane Ward, who you've heard from before, talks about Darren a lot. Um, he does key line stuff at, a, at, at farm scale in Australia, a lot, of, a lot of that kind of design. But in terms of a paint by numbers thing yourself, just by using an assessment of people and looking at the goals of, associated with the stakeholders of the land, including the, um, if, you, you, if you consider the, um, the, the, the habitat a stakeholder in the land, what does that look like? Uh, other users of the land across long time frames. Then we look at the site, then we move into design. I won't go into, into, into all of the detail of this because we'd be here for a while, but this process provides a tangible way that, that, that we can actually implement these principles. Because the challenge I hear all the time about regenerative agriculture is, oh, that's great, but how do we do it? Um, how do we implement it? So there's a series of principles. There's also expertise around with, um, you know, with, with savoury um, and accredited um, you know, EOV systems around how to implement these kinds of stuff. But this brings in a lot of the people factors associated with it as well. Yep, next one. So transition has always been the challenge, right? You've got to leave the small little fish, pot, fish tank to go to the big one, and you're at a point, I was talking about with this, this with somebody last night, is that when you make that transition, there's a point of vulnerability in there. <laughs> you know, that, that is a fish right there that is not in its natural environment. Um, it's on its way to, to get to one. How do we try and speed that up? You know, and how do we make that as, as seamless as possible? So that the creation of a 100-year plan is, is how we do that. Think longer term. How do we, how do we create a 100-year plan that provides for the future but at the same time makes sense for today? How do we live in two worlds at once? How do we avoid this binary thing of conventional versus regenerative? How do we accept this is actually a continuum and that we're moving gradually along that continuum um, rather than you know, the, the whole sort of binary mindset that we tend to focus on in, the, in, the, um, you know, in society today? So what do we need to consider? Um, in, in this kind of 100-year um, um, planning time frame? Well, we need to consider the economic viability of stuff. You know, even sustainability needs sustaining, right? One of the permaculture principles is that you must obtain a yield. Um, it's, it's like Stephen was saying earlier on, you've got to, you've got to be focused on, perfect, on purpose, but there needs to be profit, otherwise there's no purpose. You can't actually, you can't run, you can't, you can't run the thing on thin air. So it needs to stack up economically. We need to consider the environment. We need to consider health of the um, health of any, any any livestock and humans as well, including um, um, farmer mental health. That came up to um, uh, I think yesterday when we were having discussions about that. We need to consider our communities and our, our social links and, and and that innate desire to act um, as a member of um, of a, a social framework. Uh, I did a couple of case studies. I don't know if any of you guys know Maya Smith. You know Maya Smith on A T Murray Way. Well, up AT Murray Yeah, hard case farmer. The most amazing thing about this is he took a bit of forestry land, um, and uh, there's this guy, there's nothing this guy can't do sort of thing, and there's nothing you could tell him about conventional farming. He ended up going to a few regenerative farming days. He, th he says he was conned into it. Um, <laughs> he went along. Um, some of the most amazing um, evidence around the implementation at farm scale of regenerative agriculture comes from the stories of the farmers. So in my project, I did a couple of case studies. This was one of them. The most amazing thing here, look at these numbers. Animal health, $117, down to $28 per cow. The empty rate went from 20% down, down to 8%. Nitrogen fertiliser, 140 down to 30 kilos per hectare. 
saving between $170,000 and $60,000 a year just on, on those things alone. He, made his, he went to one day of milking. Uh, one, he went to once a day milking. He made his biggest profit off his lowest production. You know, this is the problem with the dairy industry, and we talked about, um, we've talked about a lot of those kind of issues, in that um, it's an extractive machine-based commodity cycle um, thing. A a and what happens is w w it's, it's a focus on kilos of milk solid produced rather than profit per hectare. And the other stakeholder aspects of that farm, including the people that live on it, the animals and, the, and all those other bits and pieces, the habitat, um, is not part of the uh, kilos per milk of, um, of, you know, kilograms of milk solid um, formula. So that's what he did. The last year's So you know, you know him, do you? It's yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, he's, he's, um, he's a hard case guy. Are, are you up that way? I just, yeah. You just know him? Part of the Curiosity Club with John King. Oh, cool, okay. Yeah, awesome. So, yeah, so thanks for that. Um, you might recognise this place. Uh, we were actually standing exactly there yesterday in the rain. That's exactly where we were standing. Um, um, I took that photo in August last year when I was here. I used Greg's farm as part of... Um, as part of the, uh, the project as well. We were looking at, um, look at that, carbon at that time was $30 a tonne. You know, it's 85 now. So we were looking at, you see the, the paddock just in there was where Greg was planting all those, um, all those plant, was planting all those stems over here that are, that are, now, that are now sort of growing up. But, um, you know, th that was another example we used of, um, of diversification on a sheep and beef property, uh, using other ways to add value to the property through diversification, uh, create more profit per hectare and not detract from production. But to do, to do so, to keep moisture in the ground during the dry period and provide habitat um, and, and biodiversity through the, through the plantings as well. And you've heard some of the great things that we're, do that we're doing here, so I don't need to go into Greg's story any further. So the challenges to this, what's getting in the way of us being able to do this kind of stuff? Well, at $5.50, I was saying to someone the other day, uh, to someone yesterday in a conversation, at $5.50 per kilo of milk solids, one third of New Zealand f uh, dairy farms are cash flow negative. Um, we had to pay it at $3.80 a few years ago, you know? <laughs> so it doesn't, there's no resilience in the system. Um, $9.60 a kilo of milk solids, man, it's a good time to make hay uh, to pay down some debt or um, in, uh, to provide a bit of breathing space to allow for a bit of experimentation. Don't turn the whole farm into a regenerative um, and don't go the whole hog, so to speak. Take a couple of steps and at $9.60 a kilo, there's a little bit of breathing room to do that. Uh, farm debt gets in the way. We've had a conversation about that. Average farm debt, $5 million. Was that right in a dairy farm? Someone said something. Was it? That was our conversation, wasn't it? Yeah, I think that's average. That's not just what we were talking about. It's really, really high. Forty billion in debt in the dairy industry and twenty in sheep and beef, so sixty in total. Yeah, I mean, it's if you're a bank and you're sitting there and you've got you know a bank, banks have two lists, right? Or well, three lists actually, but the, <laughs> the 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 other two lists are really bad. The other the, this list is fine, but the other two lists are really bad. And if you're on that list there, they're going to work with you, and you're on the other list, they're going to sell you up. So. This is the thing, uh, debt is challenging. Um, weak regulations through regional councils and government, that's also changing very, 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 very rapidly. Farm plans, the oil and nitrogen rules, the freshwater farm plans, that kind of stuff, the ETS, we've already talked about that. Um, vested interest gets in the way. If you're a fertiliser company, it's not really in your best interest to tell farmers not to use fertiliser. Uh, that's, that's, that's sort of pretty clear. So it's pretty challenging for those guys, but there are some tremendous vested interests in, in the... Um, in the, um, in the pastoral environment that, that keep things pretty much as they are. Um, perception, crazy hippies again, you know, the idea of going regenerative, oh God, he's lost his, you know, they've lost their marbles, they've headed off to join all those, all those, uh, all those people that Brad knows, you know. <laughs> Good group. I know, I know, I mean, there's worse groups of people to hang around with, right? <laughs> and the other thing too is how on earth... <laughs> How do we get there, right? What does the transition pathway look like? Well, we've got guys in the room from Savory, and you know, you can actually you can actually chart a course on a regenerative transformation, um, and people who have done it, you know. Um, so it's it's not the end of the world. So, what are the implications for New Zealand pastoral farming? Um, you, of, of this is of using regenerative and permaculture um, um, 
principles together through a design process like I showed, well it challenges the flawed industrial agriculture paradigm. But in New Zealand we're set up as an export market, commodity market, we're centralised, all of those things that are, those are the things that are getting in the way of um, you know, the kind of system that the, um, that the previous woman was talking about and that, that, that decentralised food system. We just set up completely opposite from that, we're commodity, we're long distance, we're export. Um, so this challenges that. It provides a pathway for better outcomes, um, environmental, economic, social, health and, and community. Creates export value chains. I wanna, don't want to go heaps into that, um, but I'll put AOV land to market in there because it's a classic example of, of a value chain as opposed to a supply chain. New Zealand being commodity based was all supply chains, which we, we updated the idea. I mean, it was originally about getting sheep up to um, sheep meat up to um, Mother England, right, years and years ago. That's a supply chain. Then we, then we started adding a little bit of value to that because the terminology changed and it needed to be, to be a value chain. We needed to add value to our process. But what if you threw the whole lot out, got very, very close to your customer, worked out exactly what they wanted and were able to interact directly with them? That's what value chain is all about. You know, you, it's not a commoditized market. It's about providing exactly what they want to a very, very specific market in a very close relationship. You were showing us, the, who was showing us the, 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 the shirt with the, with the, it was, oh, that was the, um, yeah, it was Finn, yeah, yeah. So, you know, snap the thing on there and you can look at the provenance of all the, uh, of the wool and where it came from and how it was produced. Great example of a value chain um, scenario. It has value to the consumer. How do you close that gap up and really, really cement that relationship? Um, and, it and using this process walks the talk of regenerative. You know, we're not regenerative in New Zealand just because most of our animals eat grass. You know, as some of our industry organisations would have us believe, that's just that's just a cop out. That's just a vested interest maintaining the status quo, right? That's the siloed nature of membership-driven ag agricultural, especially pastoral, um, um, producer uh, representation. So we're actually talking about. Um, walking the talk by doing this kind of process. Um, so what do I recommend? I recommend we better understand the implications of the macro challenges we're facing. You know, we're an export-led economy, and what happens is we have no idea what's going, out, going on out there in the big world. We still think we're just a little nation down the bottom of the country and we can just get on by ourselves. We are so open, so connected, so um, vulnerable to some of those things that are going on overseas. We really need to understand the implications of that. And that comment was, 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 was geared specifically at um, energy and the reliance we have on energy. Great to know we've just shut down our, um, our last refining facility as well. Um, I was in Wangara and I saw the last ship dock and I thought to myself, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> We need to learn about, I know if we go back one slide there, we need to learn about permaculture and regenerative agriculture and do it through a lens of being open to the discussion rather than thinking they're all crazy hippies or we're going to go broke by letting our pastures get long, right? All that sort of stuff around regenerative. We need to develop a hundred year plan for our, for our land based systems that enable us to focus on other outcomes rather than just money. Yes, it needs to pay for itself, but there's other things that's part of the mix as well. And we need to manage the farm as an ecosystem rather than a machine. You know, uh, we're not just pulling levers here um, on a system four or five dairy farm where we're, <laughs> we're focusing and chasing kilos of milk solid. Um, so instead of looking out there, and I'm not taking anything away from looking out there, <laughs> I knew I was going to hate this slide because I've already made the presentation and we're talking about stars on the earth. I'm thinking, oh, <laughs> oh God. <laughs> um, instead of looking out there, we need to focus on here. Instead of dreaming about going and living on some other planet, we need to look and focus on that particular planet. That, that is the most important thing. As Stephen Hawking um, so eloquently uh, sort of put it to us, um, who can read that? Yeah. All intuitively know what that says, right? Even though it just doesn't look what, it's, it just looks a little bit different. So we need to be able to adapt to change. And... Um, I think that's pretty much it. Thanks very much. Oh, oh no, we can yeah. say again. I can ask them. Yeah, well, I'm just looking. I'm just conscious of time. And yeah. There's some, oh, no, there's some comments and questions. Questions for for Mike. We can spend five minutes here. Yep. Yeah, well, it was just um, the region ag term has started to trigger large parts of the population. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I think we're talking about things that are axiomatic, they're going to be good no matter how you measure them or how you explain them or experience them. Yeah. 
but the regen egg term um, has a danger of having a life. And so how do we work around that and talk in terms of the benefits of it, but not just that label which could run its course and have us yeah, look for the next, um, no. or the community look for the next set of answers. The next thing. Having yeah. dismissed it without understanding what it really offers. We've also got, that's a really good point, we've also got another danger too in that um, just like the word love, um, regenerative agriculture is in very real danger of being co-opted and devalued. Um, everything is regenerative these days, even if it's not. Um, so there's this, there's this idea that as long as we call it that for long enough, then it becomes that. Um, and then, then on the flip side, we've got the regenerative, oh, that's just another, that, that's just another word for biodynamic, or that's just another word for, for whatever. And yeah, sustainable, yeah. And, and the great thing about that, and that's why I focused on principles, is when you look behind the label and start looking at what the principles are and what the principles are not so much telling you to do, but they're encouraging you to think about. That's the key to it. To get past a lot of the um, uh, superficial media and, and, and co-option of the term um, and focus on the principles. That's how I would, that's how I would deal with that. Yeah, thanks. It's a great point. And you know when Jacinda Ardern starts talking about regenerative, you just think, oh, that's a political football. Yeah, I don't think that a lot of people who talk about regenerative know what it means. Um, I think it's a very easy term to talk about because people think they know what it means. Uh, that, that is from an audience perspective. But when you would ask a person, okay, so what are the principles associated with regenerative agriculture? I'm pretty sure not many people could actually tell you. That was the great thing about the work that Gwen Grillet did. There were 75 authors, uh, co-authors on that paper, on that white paper that she did in um, 2021. She worked for Lanky Research at the time. Actually, she still does, but she's been co-opted to Calm the Farm as well, so she's doing some work for them. But that was a massive body of work um, around trying to define what regenerative agriculture means in a New Zealand context, and guess what? Couldn't do it. She could only define the mindset associated with it and then came up with some principles as a result. So, um, yeah, that was a pretty exhaustive study. Yeah. So principles, once again, is the, is the answer. That's what I see. Um, what the whole society actually is that we need principle led not rule based. Yeah. Because, yeah. I think that's what makes a North Star. Yeah. Principles. Yeah, you can you get you get attracted to principles and you sort of tend to I don't know if you're anything like me, you tend to rebel against rules. So, um, you know, principles tend to be, you tend to get aligned with them and want to move in that direction. They're inviting, whereas the other things are not so inviting. Principles are solid, aren't they? How's, how's your reception been uh, telling this to the Kellogg community and other farmers? It's actually been really strong. Um, I've been surprised and over the course of the year momentum has sort of gathered around this. I know MPI are really keen on this. I've spoken to John Roach at MPI and he's Chief Science Advisor and you know but he's in a very very political position and this is very very politically convenient to be involved with right now. So there is a little bit of um, uh, momentum that this is gathering but you know, Savory's been doing this for, in lots of ways, through holistic grazing, holistic management for years. Um, it, it, and if we, go, if we stick with the principles and avoid the hype, then it's, then it's quite good. Interesting, the guy that I was presenting with, his topic was um, how can you squeeze as much production as you possibly can out of a Northland dairy farm and stay within the rules? So, <laughs> <laughs> so that was his topic. He now works for Dairy NZ, by the way. So that's... Yeah, he went from being a fertiliser rep to working for Dairy NZ. So that was, um, and, and ironically, he and I did a panel discussion after we presented basically two diametrically opposed papers. And um, we had a panel discussion. We agreed on more things that we, than we disagreed about, which was, uh, which was quite encouraging. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it is interesting. <laughs> yeah. What's your take on lab-grown protein? Um, I think lab-grown protein is a novel idea and it's going to be useful for all of those people who think that technology is going to fix everything, but it takes no consideration um, of the energy required to, um, to grow that. It takes no consideration of the water required to um, actually make that happen and it does not consider the antibiotics that would be used to keep that protein sterile and safe for human consumption 
Whereas a living animal does tend to sort of take care of a lot of those things, and the rain tends to fall out of the sky relatively normally. So um, we have, uh, there is going to be a segment of the marketplace that's going to love that idea. Um, but in terms of is that going to solve the problems, I mean, it's totally energy blind for a start. It has no idea the amount of energy that takes to create, you know, kilo for kilo um, animal protein. Um, and those other considerations. So novel idea, uh, short version is I'm not a fan. But, you know, am I the market for that? Probably not. So you might need to ask somebody who is, if you can find them. Is <laughs> <laughs> it not regenerative? Um, I don't believe that's regenerative. I, I don't know how that contributes to any of the other bits and pieces that we talked about there. Um, you know, I think it might create the illusion of being... This is the problem. Environmentalism has lost... Um, it's been untethered from ecology, and, and, that, and that's the real challenge. Environmentalism gives people the opportunity for virtue signaling to talk about how wonderful it is as they drive their Tesla, saving the world one kilowatt at a time, right? Um, without un any understanding of the resources they consumed to be able to do that. Uh, so that's environmentalism versus ecology, which looks deeply at the, um, at the relationship of the natural world and our interaction within it as part of it, rather than as being separate from it. So... Yeah, that's right. Does that kind of get there? No. Yeah, I don't know. Neither do I. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool, was it? Yeah, the UN is saying you should only be consuming 14 grams a day of animal protein mm -hmm. down the track, and that's yeah. one mouthful, and taxing farmers who produce far too much animal protein. Well, I, I fear the UN's become a political organisation, um, and I don't su subscribe to a lot of the rhetoric that I hear out of the, out of the UN. Um, Most people do. Mm. Well, I think that's the challenge, is that people still believe that the UN is a, um, is a wonderful, caring, embracing organisation that cares about everybody. And, you know, I think they, they think that. And that's, that's great. I don't think that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there is the lab grown meat. Oh, yeah. It's so sustainable. Yeah. No consideration of energy or, or resources associated with that. Which is why they're giving them that. And where do you get the cow from? Yeah. 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 We could probably grow it in a lab. I, I don't know. I don't know. You know? Are we done? Cool. Um, if you want to have a yarn, of course, just grab me and we'll have a chat, but I'm conscious that we probably need to... I'll hand back to you. Yep. Thanks for um, doing that. That's, that's cool. Thank you, guys.